Alrighty, good day everyone and welcome. We're at the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Cheryl Rogers and I'm the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix. Our webcast today is presented by Ashley Hintz, our Field Application Scientist. Ashley is going to discuss the utility of the SVS software for GWAS using SNP data for Arabidopsis theliana. She's also going to demonstrate how SVS can be used in data management and the analysis process as well. Ashley, take it away. All right, great. Thanks, Cheryl. If anyone has questions during the presentation, I encourage you to enter them in the go to panes window, go to meeting window, sorry about that, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Okay, by way of introduction, um, the idea for this webcast came about from three previous webcasts that we've presented on. Uh, maximizing public data sources, a back to basics over GWAS, and a mixed model webinar which you can find on our website. And all of these combined together will give us the topic of today's webinar. In addition, we're also adding non-human data for GWAS using Arabidopsis thaliana data. So the agenda for today is I'll give you an overview of the data set that we'll be using. Uh, then we'll go over how I downloaded the public data and where it was found. We'll go through an SVS demonstration and then we'll end with questions. So Golden Helix's SNP and Variation Suite software was created specifically for genetic research initially developed for GWAS. Since then it has expanded for other analyses including DNA-seq. The performance, usability, and visualization have made the software an obvious and popular choice for genetic researchers and has resulted in hundreds of citations in peer-reviewed articles. You can see a list of these articles on our website at goldenhelix.com if you are interested. Okay, so our first agenda item is the data overview. This data set that I'll be using today was downloaded from the Gregor Mendel Institute for Molecular Plant Biology through at PolyDB. It was generated using a custom Affymetrix 250K SNP chip. The data that I'm using today has been used in several other publications. I'm drawing the data today from a Nature article from Atwell et al. 2010, where they genotyped 1,307 samples covering 214,000 markers. They documented 107 different phenotypes covering flowering, ionomics, defense, and development. The trait that I'll be looking at today for this GWAS presentation is a trait associated with virulence to Pseudomonas. And the picture you see to your right is an Arabidopsis plant affected with Pseudomonas. Okay, next we'll I'll go through how the public data was imported into SVS. The genotype data was downloaded as a CSV file containing the haploid genotypes. It was imported as a text file in SVS using a Python script to convert the homozygous diploid genotypes for analysis. The sample data was a text file detailing collection site of, of the samples including GPS coordinates. An additional text file with the phenotypes for 199 samples was also imported. Um, However, the phenotypes recorded were spotty for the study, and I'm only using 84 samples, which cover all of the phenotypes. And then both of these spreadsheets were imported into SVS for further analysis. And all of this data manipulation is easily accomplished in SVS. Okay, the Reference sequence and genome assembly was downloaded from arabidopsis.org. The reference sequence was a FASTA format. The gene annotations was a GFF3 format. And these are standard formats for bioinformatics. And they were both converted to the native TSF format in SVS. OK, now we'll move on to the SVS demonstration. And the agenda for that, I'll go through some quality assurance filters with the data, then we'll perform a principal components analysis, a genotype association test, an MAX analysis, and then we'll end with visualizations. All right, let's launch SVS. Oh, that's just a security warning on my computer. Okay. 
So this is our SVS project window. A couple things I want to point out. This is very much a project-oriented software. There's a project navigation window, which will list all of the spreadsheets that I create during the project analysis. Over here in the node change log, it will keep track of all of the functions that I've performed. And over down in the lower right corner, you can also add notes to any of the spreadsheets listed over here. Now, I've already imported the two spreadsheets that I'll be starting with today. I have my spreadsheet of phenotypic data, which I'll go ahead and show you. A couple things to note about our spreadsheet format is every column is listed with a blue letter. R stands for a real number, I is an integer, C is categorical data, B is binary data, and in the genotype spreadsheet, all genotypes are listed with a blue G. Now another thing to point out is up in the upper right hand corner is the dimensions of the spreadsheet. As I mentioned before, there are 84 samples that I'll be using today with the 214,000 markers. And over in the left hand corner, there's this green map button. And this contains information of where the marker is found with chromosome and position, reference in gene name if it's associated. And this will be important when we look at the data in Genome Browse. So to start off with some quality assurance, we'll go up to the genotype menu. And we'll start with statistics by marker and we'll look at the allele frequencies. That should run really quickly. Okay, so I really wanted to look at the minor allele frequency to see the range and if there's anything that I need to remove from the data set before we continue because SNPs with very low frequency do not have enough statistical power. And the easiest way to visualize this is to right click with your mouse and plot histogram of the minor allele frequency. Now this is our graphical interface. And there are, the utility of this is very flexible. You can increase the bin size for the graph if need be. I think it looks good here. And I can also zoom in into the area of the graph that I'm interested in. So down here I may need to increase the bin size a little bit. There we are. So I do have a number of SNPs below 0 0.05, so I'm going to want to remove those from the data set, which is, again, easily accomplished. Get rid of these here. So I can go back up to the genotype menu, and then genotype filtering by marker. I can drop if the minor allele frequency is below 0 0.05, and we'll run that really quickly. Okay. So it pops out this spreadsheet telling me if it was dropped from analysis, what the frequency was. Anything with a 1 means it was dropped. And I can come back to my original spreadsheet, and in the dimensions up in the corner, I can see there's 200,000 markers left. And if I scroll out just a little bit, there we are. Any of these columns that have turned gray indicate that it was removed by the filtering and will no longer be used in any analyses I apply to this spreadsheet. But instead, I'm going to go ahead and subset this spreadsheet, which is a button up in the upper left corner, column subset spreadsheet. There we are. And just so I know what I'm dealing with, I'm going to go ahead and rename this. That way I won't lose track of it. Okay, from this spreadsheet, I also want to apply an LD pruning procedure to reduce the set of SNPs that are correlated. So back up in the genotype menu, under quality assurance, we can go down to LD pruning. And I'm going to modify these parameters a little bit just to make it go a little faster for today's presentation. Click OK. It's going to scan the spreadsheet and remove the correlated SNPs, and I'll end up with a smaller set of SNPs to do principal components analysis with. And we're almost done.
All right, and it tells me how many markers were inactivated, which is great. And you can see in the spreadsheet there were many more columns that were inactivated by turning them gray. And up in the corner, I can see that I am down to 86,000 SNPs. So again, I want to make a subset of this spreadsheet. And I will rename it. And LD pruned. There we are. Okay. Now from this spreadsheet, I want to run a principal components analysis. So again, up in the genotype menu, we'll be spending a lot of time there today. I can go down to genotype principal components analysis. And the default parameters will be sufficient for today. Click run. Okay, we're almost halfway done. Now after I have the principal components, I'll show you a graph and how to merge spreadsheets of the eigenvalues. We're almost done here. Okay, and the two spreadsheets I get are my 10 principal components that I asked for of eigenvalues and then the eigenvectors in another spreadsheet. Now from the eigenvector spreadsheet I want to merge this with my phenotype data because it makes a more dynamic graph and I will show that to you. So I just clicked the little jigsaw button and it opens this window and I can click my phenotype data, click OK and default parameters are great. So now I have a spreadsheet of my phenotypic data and those eigenvalues. And I want to make an XY scatter plot, which is just this little blue dot button. So I'll pick my top two components here and plot. Okay. Now to me, these dots seem a little small, so I can make them bigger. I can click on this, and where it says the symbol, I can just increase the symbol size. And then I also want to color this by a variable. Now this is where the phenotypic data that I added comes in because I want to color by the area that they were collected. Okay. And you can see that depending on where the area it was from, it comes out into a separate grouping on the graph. All of these green dots are from North America, the pink being from Scandinavia. So this shows me there's a bit of population stratification associated with the data. So that's something I'm going to keep in mind as going through this analysis. So we'll go ahead and close this graph. We'll close the spreadsheet. And we'll close that spreadsheet. Because the next thing I want to do is a genotype association test. So I will come back to just my minor low frequency filter data. And I'm going to go up to here and hit activate all because I want all of those 200,000 SNPs back. Okay, now from here I need to select my dependent variable, which through all this phenotype data I'm going to scroll out to. Okay, so here is my phenotype associated with the resistance to Pseudomonas and I've just clicked it once and turned it this magenta color and it recognizes it as the dependent variable and identifies it as a case control. And then I can come back to genotype, genotype association tests. And I have a lot of options in this window, but I'm gonna stick with the additive model and do a Cochrane Armitage test. And I also want to click the Lambda factor. And you'll see some of these other options have been turned gray. Those are associated with chi-square tests, so they do not come into play with the lambda factor. And then I'm also going to click the output for a QQ plot and run that. And this should go quickly. And there we are. Okay, from this spreadsheet, I want to take a look and see how it's fit the data. The association test has fit the data. So I'm going to plot this 
oops, sorry about that. We'll go with this way. We're going to plot the expected versus the original. Okay, now I also want to add a trend line to see add item. And I can see that the expected versus the original is not quite following the trend line as we would expect it to. So knowing that, I want to come back and see what that lambda factor was. So we'll minimize some of these spreadsheets. And if I click on the association test spreadsheet, over in the node change log, it tells me what that inflation factor was, and it's 1.64. I'd like to see a value more closer to 1. So I can tell that the population stratification ha is having a impact on the data. So instead of running a typical genotype association test, I'm going to run an Emma X association. And the Emma X will explicitly account for the pairwise allele sharing rates. So I'll come back to my spreadsheet here where I have my dependent variable selected up to the genotype menu and then mixed linear model analysis. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Oh, you know what? Before I run that, I need to create a identity by descent matrix as a pre-computed kinship for the MX, and that's something I want calculated with this spreadsheet. So we'll go up to genotype, quality assurance, identity by descent estimation. Now this will give you a number of different spreadsheets, but I don't need either of these. I just want my IBS distances. I'll click run. Okay. Now this just gives me a square matrix of my 84 samples. And this is capturing the observed similarity between them. Okay. Now I can run my MX from the minor allele filtered spreadsheet. Okay, so I'll click the Emma X and then use a pre-computed kinship matrix, which is what I had to go back and do. Select sheet, and this is where I select my IBS distance. Click OK. And all of the defaults look good. I'm going to go into additional outputs and get data for a QQ plot. That looks great. Go ahead and click OK. Now this will take an extra minute to run. It's doing some extra background calculations. Once we have this spreadsheet, I'll show you again a expected versus original of the p-values to see if this is fitting the data better. And then we'll also visualize the data in Genome Browse and create some Manhattan plots. It looks like my initial scan is almost done. Now it's performing the MX scan. We're almost halfway there, over halfway. And we are just about done here. And there's the spreadsheet that I was hoping for. Yay! Okay. So again, I want to create a plot of the expected versus the original values. Whoops, not that one. I'll plot this. And again, I'm going to add my trend line to see how it's fitting the data. And since it's laying more on that line until the very end, that's fitting the data a lot better than the original association test, which is great. Another thing I have not pointed out about our graphical interface is that all of these points are clickable. And if I click on the top point, I can see what value it was given from the association test and what marker it is. So I can come back to the spreadsheet. Oops, there we go. And if I right click, I can sort this to see the most significant values that come to the top. And I can open my map and see which marker was associated with that value. 
but I also want to visualize this information in Genome Browse to create a Manhattan plot. And that is really easy to do. All you have to do is right click with your mouse on this column and plot variable in Genome Browse. Now this will take a moment to import the data. Okay, so this is my Emma X association results and it looks like the highest peak is indeed on chromosome 3, but I also want to compare this with my other association results so I can come up to the add button. Under project, I can scroll to the first association that I performed and get the results from that. Plot and close. Okay, and again, it still had the same association, but I want to look at these on the same plot, so I'm going to change the color of this top one, which is easy to do under the style tab. So instead of blue, I'm going to make it pink. Click OK. Now it does have to redraw it in real quick. But I'm also going to come over here to the plot tree window and click and drag my other plot into the same window and close that one. So now they should be popping up in the same graph plot. Okay, now that I have these in the same plot, I'm going to zoom in and that's easy to do if you just use your scroll wheel on your mouse and scroll up. And I want to zoom in really close so I can see what gene we're looking at. And again, I can click on these points and get the data from the spreadsheet. And it looks like in both association tests, the same marker was popping out as most significant. I can also click on the gene track down here. And it will give me some basic information about that gene. And I also have these links out to external databases. And I know the one that works for Rapidopsis is NCBI. So that will open a web browser. And it tells me it is the RPM1 disease resistance protein gene in a Rapidopsis, which shows a good association since we are looking at a disease resistance to Pseudomonas. So I'll go ahead and close that. Now I'm zooming back out a bit. The next thing I want to do is create a Manhattan plot colored by chromosome. So I'm going ahead and remove the Armitage results. And I can click on this graph and style instead of by uniform, by chromosome. Okay. And another thing that I forgot to do earlier was add the reference sequence for Rabidopsis, which is easy to do. It's down in my local annotations, it, which are anything I've downloaded to my local computer, plot and close, and it pops out at the top, but I want it at the bottom, so all I have to do is drag and drop. And again, if I zoom in real far, You can see the amino acid sequence and the nucleotide sequence. From Genome Browse, you can also export all of the images you've created. All you have to do is come up to File, Save as Image, browse to where you want it saved, and save. That's taking a minute to come in here, but up oh, there it comes. But I've already done this, so I'm going to go ahead and click cancel that, and we'll exit Genome Browse, and my spreadsheet here, my graph, and another spreadsheet, cleaning up my desktop. Cancel. Okay, and we'll come back to the PowerPoint here. So we're on to our last item in our agenda. These are the graphs that were published by Atwell et al. for their association for the pseudomonas resistance 
and they did find RPM1 as the associated gene and it's on chromosome 3 at about 2.2 megabases and here are the graphs I created in Genome Browse and again we're on chromosome 3 at about 2.2 megabases so as you can see we in about 30 minutes have created the same association that was shown in Atwell at all and I hope you saw something useful that you can apply to your own research today and with that I will pass it back to Cheryl Thank you, Ashley. Uh, like Ashley mentioned, we're going to go ahead and answer some questions. I have a couple of quick announcements, and while I give those, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the questions pane now. Um, the webcast and recording will be up on our website tomorrow, um, so you can use it for reference if you'd like. Our next webcast is scheduled for July 22nd. That will be presented by Heather Husson of the Animal Sciences Department at Cornell University. And we will be sending out invitations for that very soon. Um, and that's it for me, so we're gonna go ahead and take some questions. Um, let's see, what operating system does SBS support and what computer specs are required to run the program? Sure, so we offer SVS on Windows 64-bit and 32-bit, Mac and Linux, and for today I'll show you the specs on the computer that I'm using. So this is a, lap, a Windows 64 laptop with 8 gigabytes of memory, which as you saw has enough computing power to run these analyses very effectively. Okay, let's see, what kind of organisms does SVS support? For the full functionality of SVS, um, a diploid organism with a well-characterized reference sequence is ideal. Um, there is still some functionality for haploid organisms and organisms with a scaffold reference sequence as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the lambda value you calculated, what does that mean? So that value shows how far the data is skewed from expected. The value should be around 1, but a value 1.1 to 1 is considered adequate. So in this case, the data was being influenced by the population structure, which is why we had a lambda value of 1.64. Okay. Can you export the data? Yes. Data can be exported as Excel spreadsheets, text files, among others, and the graphs are also exportable as images. Let's see, oh, we've got a question asking if the webcast will be available later, and I will get that up for you guys just as soon as possible um, tomorrow, if not today. Um, alrighty, I think with that we're going to close up. If we didn't answer your questions, I will make sure that we get in touch with you in the next day or so to take care of them for you. Um, I'm going to sign off. Ashley, thank you again so much for your time today, and I hope that everyone out there enjoys their day, and we will see you soon.